U.S. Special Forces encounter giants in Antarctica. You heard it here first. It was the early 2000s, right around the same time as the Kandahar Giant, when a team of Navy SEALs was called to Antarctica. Their mission was to plunge deep into the ice shelf and explore ruins recently discovered by ground penetrating radar. Upon arrival at the site, they would begin their descent down a large pre-drilled hole that would open up into a cavern. As soon as their boots hit the ground, they would quickly realize the cavern was actually a massive megalithic structure. The structures were thousands of years old, and they believed them to be built by the ancient builder race, the same ones that built the pyramids. Amazed, they began exploring, eventually stumbling upon a large door. One of the seals would approach the door and touch it with his hand. To their surprise, it began shifting, almost as if powered by anti-gravity. The 30-foot door would move back and to the side, letting them into the corridor. In utter disbelief, they decide to split up into groups of two. They cautiously make their way around the room, noticing hieroglyphs of which they had never seen before. As they sweep the area, senses heightened, one of the men yells, Guys, come look at this! As the rest of the team approaches this portion of the structure, they instantly notice the super advanced tech, and their comrades staring at a large crystal chamber. They brush a layer of frost off that has accumulated over thousands of years. And inside, they see it. It's approximately 14 to 16 feet tall. Its massive frame towering over the men. Its eyes still open with a fierce look on its face, almost as if it's staring at them. The warm blood running through their veins turns cold. As it is said, when a soldier first experiences these beings, it changes them. They will never be the same, but some take it better than others. It is reported that some soldiers lose their head completely upon sight. They simply cannot handle it. They have to back out. Others' hair has turned completely gray in an instant. They are simply that afraid. As they're pondering over what they're looking at, one of the soldiers says, Guys, check it out. They look over, and two of the chambers have already been broken through. These crystal chambers had them in a stasis, and they are now waking up. That's when the lead seal yells out, All right, fellas, you know what time it is. On me. They hastily start swapping out the cliffs on their assault rifles. They've come prepared, as if they already knew what they were going to encounter. The rounds in these new magazines were something special. They weren't regular hollow point lead. They were actually made of pure copper. As the military and the Pentagon knew that pure copper is the only thing that kills these beasts. Using anything else is futile and will not hurt them. As they're finally getting locked and loaded, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they hear a cry. And no sooner do they turn around, one of the beasts flies from behind a megalith. It grabs one of the soldiers and slams him to the ground, killing him instantly. The second beast jumps from a ledge above, landing on another, squishing him to a pulp. Fire, fire, fire! They open up. The beasts run through the bullets as if they don't even touch them. The rest of the men scramble to take cover. They slide to cover and look back. They're gone. They move throughout the corridor swiftly and silently. Sorry, right, y'all. Gotta do a part two for this one. So after shooting the giants with the pier copper rounds, they can tell it had an effect. They were slowed enough for the team to take cover behind a monument. And when they peek back around the edge to see where they're at, the giants are gone. So after taking a moment to gather themselves, they start heading down the opposite direction of the corridor. They stay within cover of the pillars running down the entire walkway, and they cover ground fairly quickly. They've covered probably close to a quarter mile. This cavern is huge. When suddenly they hear the two giants cry out, they turn around, and there they stand in the middle of the corridor. They begin trotting towards them and then full on sprint. They're coming for them. The seals begin to engage their targets again. This time, they don't walk through it. They begin to slow in their run and eventually fall to the ground. The copper rounds work, and before long, they're laying there breathless. A sense of relief swarms over the team, but it was short-lived. As soon as the other two dropped, another cry. It was the third giant. It was out of its stasis. Move, move, move! The seals turn and begin running. They look back, see the giant running towards them, and continue. They can hear his footsteps and then they just stop and they turn to see where he's at. He's gone. It seems as if though he's almost playing with his food. They see another large doorway at the end of the hall, probably another quarter mile up. They're glancing around looking for the giant. They can't see him. Then as they're passing a section with large monuments on each side, one of the soldiers in the very back lets out a blood curdling cry. The giant appears as if a blur from one side of the hallway to the other and on the way through he grabs another soldier. So he seems preoccupied with the said soldier for a little bit grabbing his first out of stasis meal. The team approaches the doorway and again it's being blocked off by a large stone slab. One of the soldiers notices a cutout in the rock wall and they press it. It begins moving, the giant hears it. He looks up and starts their way, moving swiftly. Hold him off fellas, let's go. The team engages the target again. At this point there's only three or four of them left and the giant's running through the bullets as if they're nothing. It's not looking good when the group lead throws his gun down and reaches for a pouch on his vest. 
At this point, the door has finally slid open. It's within feet. They dart through, the lead soldier turns around and chucks a grenade through the doorway. It's full of copper bearings. Take cover! They step behind the wall, the grenade goes off. Dozens of bearings hit the giant, the door slams. They made it. Relieved, they turn around to a massive cave system. They can't believe the size. They figure its total width is a couple miles. It is believed that the giants themselves and whoever created them had bored a tunnel. This tunnel ran from Antarctica all the way up to the Northwest Territories in Canada. They supposedly have a plasma drill that can drill up to seven miles a day. This is what they use for travel. This large tunnel has smaller tunnels branching off of it, leading through the mountains. Likely where all the missing hikers end up. The soldiers would eventually find their way to the surface, contact command. Most of them never spoke of it again. All right, y'all. So my boy is back at it again. For those of you that don't know, I got a source who lives in Cali whose grandfather and father hailed from Mexico. They share stories, and they shared their folklore with him. And what he says about the giants, y'all, come on, here we go. So his grandfather would say that there's five different types of giants that have inhabited Earth. And of these five different types of giants, two were evil. He would explain the largest giants to ever inhabit Earth would walk from land to land through the oceans. The deepest of waters would come up to the majority of their shoulders, but the biggest of all, it would only come up to their waist. His grandfather didn't know much about these giants because they were the oldest. These giants would die off and there were very few left even before the first great earth war. That they were full of energy and they were highly intelligent. So much so that they became one with mother nature. That they were pure, nothing but love and light. That they were so in tune with Mother Nature and Mother Earth that upon their deaths, they would become island chains or mountain ranges. Sicilian folklore about giants explained the same thing, but they did have conflicts, and many of those conflicts led to a lot of their demise. The second type of giants and the second tallest ranged from 20 to 40 feet tall. These giants were dumb and generally overweight. Not only would they eat each other, but they would eat humans as well. They would literally destroy everything in their path and were easily manipulated and bribed by evil factions on Earth. His grandfather would say that these giants were clumsy and slow, easily killed by a fast opponent. Literally abominations. This brings us to the third type. The third group of giants were 20 to 30 feet tall. They were blue and they had horns, massive goat horns, and that they loved to party. These giants were good natured and generally didn't like violence. They were highly intelligent and had the power to heal. They had a few warriors to protect them, but other than that, they were not a violent faction. His grandfather would say that these giants had the sacred knowledge of old. When the great earth wars came, they didn't want to partake and they didn't want to fight, but they would provide healing for the good factions. And their warriors that did fight were super fast and were absolute killing machines. This made me think of Norse mythology and the frost giants of old. But this brings us to the fourth type. There will be a part two. If you want to see the fourth and fifth types, check out my live tonight. This is the legend of the Kandahar giant and his encounter with US Special Forces. It was 2002 in Kandahar during the war in Afghanistan when a US Special Forces unit that specialized in rescue missions was called to duty. Their mission, to find a unit that seemed to have just vanished deep within the mountains. They wasted no time and began moving as they wanted to be back before nightfall. According to an eyewitness that was part of the Special Forces Unit, they had trekked four miles up the side of the mountain and they were almost to the last pinpointed location of the lost unit when they began finding broken military equipment strewn about all throughout the mountains. That's when they looked up and noticed a massive cave. As they approached the cave, they noticed a rancid smell and began seeing body parts laying all over the ground. When all of a sudden, an 18-foot tall giant flew out of the cave, spearing one of their men. Stunned, the unit immediately opens fire, letting them have it. Part 2 This is the legend of the Kandahar giant, part 2. He was a monster, the witness explained. You could see in your peripherals, the body stacked up at the cave entrance. This led us to believe he was a cannibal. With a red beard and scarlet red long hair covering his shoulders, and Dan, whose body lay limp at the end of his spear. As I noticed he had six fingers and toes, the lieutenant yells fire, snapping me back to reality. We began shooting the beast, quickly noticing the bullets were having little effect. The beast tosses Dan 30 feet off the end of the spear, as if nothing but a toy. He moved so swiftly, you would never believe he was actually as big as he was. Wielding his spear, he began barreling towards us with bloodthirsty rage on his face. And as if instinct kicked in all at once, we all yelled out, Aim for the head! The team was carrying an M4 submachine gun, a 308 sniper rifle, and a Barrett 50 caliber. Within seconds, he fell to the ground lifeless. 
and the team remembers the day they battled the Kandahar Giant, Part 3. Legend of the Kandahar Giant, Part 3. So as the giant lay there dead, they radio back to base, and a chopper comes and picks it up. It weighed in about 1,200 pounds. This beast had a total of 12 fingers and 12 toes. And by witness account, it smelled like it hadn't bathed in probably 10 years. Nasty. And of course, standard procedure as they got back to the base, they made them sign a hush-hush agreement, stating that the world wasn't ready for this info. The witness who shared this story felt that the people should know, and that there was no reason to keep us in the dark. At the end of the day, I know this is hard for some of you to believe, but giants have been in our history since the Bible, the biblical days. The Nephilim are fallen angels that came down and bred with humans. This enhanced our race. That being said, I ain't telling you, you gotta believe shit. Believe what you want. And one guy promised he was 22 feet as well. His body is in Ohio. Tune in next time. Alright y'all, so my boy is back at it again. For those of you that don't know, I got a source who lives in Cali whose grandfather and father hailed from Mexico. They share stories, and they shared their folklore with him. And what he says about the giants, y'all, come on, here we go. So his grandfather would say that there's five different types of giants that have inhabited Earth. And of these five different types of giants, two were evil. He would explain the largest giants to ever inhabit Earth would walk from land to land through the oceans. The deepest of waters would come up to the majority of their shoulders, but the biggest of all, it would only come up to their waist. His grandfather didn't know much about these giants because they were the oldest. These giants would die off and there were very few left even before the first great earth war. That they were full of energy and they were highly intelligent. So much so that they became one with mother nature. That they were pure, nothing but love and light. That they were so in tune with mother nature and mother earth that upon their deaths they would become island chains or mountain ranges. Sicilian folklore about giants explain the same thing, but they did have conflicts, and many of those conflicts led to a lot of their demise. The second type of giants, and the second tallest, ranged from 20 to 40 feet tall. These giants were dumb and generally overweight. Not only would they eat each other, but they would eat humans as well. They would literally destroy everything in their path, and were easily manipulated and bribed by evil factions on Earth. His grandfather would say that these giants were clumsy and slow, easily killed by a fast opponent. Literally abominations. This brings us to the third type. The third group of giants were 20 to 30 feet tall. They were blue and they had horns, massive goat horns, and that they loved to party. These giants were good natured and generally didn't like violence. They were highly intelligent and had the power to heal. They had a few warriors to protect them, but other than that, they were not a violent faction. His grandfather would say that these giants had the sacred knowledge of old. When the Great Earth Wars came, they didn't want to partake and they didn't want to fight, but they would provide healing for the good factions. And their warriors that did fight were super fast and were absolute killing machines. This made me think of Norse mythology and the frost giants of old. But this brings us to the fourth type. There will be a part two. If you want to see the fourth and fifth types, check out my live tonight. The fourth group of giants were 15 to 30 feet tall. They had eagle or reptilian legs, were sometimes green, and had wings. Book of Enoch, anybody? The Fallen? They were so evil, they loved to eat humans, especially offspring. These beings possessed evil magical powers, so much so that when they would walk through Mother Nature, Everything around them and behind them would die. They would lure in men and women and control them with their black magic. With their flying abilities, they were a force to be reckoned with. They almost looked angelic. His grandfather would go on to state that they were so evil that they could be killed with water and dirt when shoved in their mouth. That's how out of tune their energy was with Mother Nature. The fifth group of giants were 15 to 30 feet tall. These were our ancient ancestors, and they looked just like us. They were inherently good, and they wanted to help mankind succeed. They hail from all over the world, and they hailed from a time when our ancestors were just actually that tall. At this time, before the Third Earth War, the nations were all love and light. They were in tune with Mother Nature. The Great Flood, pushed them into the subterranean pockets. 
where it is said today some of them have been kept cryogenically frozen in crystalline like structures. It's even believed by some that they're awakening today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Come back for more. Like, subscribe, follow, all that good stuff. Love you guys. Peace out. This is the Cherokee legend of the Appalachian Giant. The story goes a group of Cherokee Indians was hunting deep within the Appalachian Mountains when they hear a Hulk-like roar. They look at each other and whisper, Junikala. And no sooner do they say his name, the ground starts shaking. Boom! 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 See, Cherokee folklore states that you were supposed to ask permission to hunt on that side of the Tuckasagi River from Judicala, and if you didn't, he'd know. This angered Judicala, so he began chasing them. The Cherokee men would have a head start of about two miles, but it took him no time to catch up, finally leaping a thousand feet in the air. When he would land on this soapstone, it's known as the Judicala Stone. The seven-fingered beast would leave an imprint that you can still see today. Many believe he has to do with the missing people, too. Cherokee Legend of the Appalachian Giant, Part 2. This giant would chase the Cherokee hunters until he got them off his land. They should consider themselves lucky. He was not known to be a man-eater, but he was aggressive about his territory. So a lot of theorists believe that he has to do with all of the missing people throughout the Appalachian Mountains. There's a true story about a child who got lost at 2,000 feet and they ended up finding him at 8,000 feet. There's no way he could have gotten that high without the help of something or someone. Scientists figure the soapstone with his handprint could be thousands of years old. They believe it depicts the indigenous people living on one side of the river and the giant on this side. And if you crossed it, you could end up dead. I know it may seem hard to believe, but Paul Bunyan has been a Minnesota legend for years. It is believed his footprints created the 14,000 lakes of Minnesota.